2020 is Dr. Barrett Pankania, expert in respiratory diseases and pandemic planning and senior clinical lecturer at the University of Exeter and resident of Coombe Down in Bath. Uh, Barrett, good morning to you. Hello, good morning. Good morning, John. Good morning. I was rather hoping that you and I weren't going to speak before Christmas, um, but obviously thank you for agreeing once again to be on the programme. Where are we, do you think, right now with this pandemic? So, John, just before coming online to yourself, I thought I'd better uh, have a look at the data myself again. And um, what strikes me is the steepness of the gradient. In other words, the number of cases in a short period of time is um, escalating, escalating in a very steep manner, implying that there is a rising tide of cases uh, it's not like it's peaking. It's 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 still further to go. So, John, um, I'm concerned. I'm of course concerned that we've got this rising tide. It may not materialize into hospital admissions, but if it does, I can see trouble ahead. It's interesting you say that because if you look at the the, the government dashboard, and I've gone through this in quite some detail. Uh, last night ahead of talking with you this morning. Uh, the actual test positive over the last 70, uh, seven days is up by 52%. Um, those who are dying within 28 days, death within 28 days of a positive test is down by 6.5%. And patients admitted to hospital is up by just over 8%. And when you look at the actual hospitalisation numbers and those on ventilation within those in hospital, that number is fairly, well, it's plateaued. It hasn't changed pretty much since July. Yes, yes, indeed. And that is what we are looking at, which is uh, most certainly a reflection on Delta virus infections. Uh, however, with the introduction of Omicron, and we don't know, we just don't know what Omicron is going to do with hospitalizations and deaths. But if we look at the case numbers, uh, the gradient, as I said, is very, very mm. steep. And I just hope, I, you know, we're clutching at all sorts of good luck charms that this doesn't materialize into um, surge in ill cases and a surge in deaths to follow. There is always a lag period. So what we are looking at right now is a reflection on Delta. Um, what we will look at from mid-January onwards would be the effects of Omicron, okay. which we don't know at the moment. And this gets to the heart of Dan's question in Clifton. Morning, Dan. Thank you for your question. How much do we know about Omicron and its severity? Because we know Delta, if you get it, is bad news. But how much do we know about Omicron and its severity, asks Dan? Well, let's, uh, let's rehearse this for our listeners. Uh, what we know and what we don't know. So what we do know is uh, this 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 variant is much more infectious, considerably more, five times more than the Delta variant. Now that is significant. That 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 alone is worrisome. The second bit that we also know about it, uh, and also equally worrisome is that the antibodies that we produced with the vaccines may not be now fully compatible with Omicron, the new variant. So our antibodies are working, but not all of those antibodies are working. Uh, unfortunately, uh, some of the antibodies cannot latch onto the virus and neutralize it. Now the third bit, which is answering Dan's specific question, which is how severe disease causing it, it is. The answer is, we don't know. We don't know because the hospitalizations, et cetera, has not happened yet at a population level. On the other hand, there are some worrying reports from a Imperial University study, which indicated that it may be as, as disease causing, as much disease causing as the Delta variant. If that is the case, then we have a lot of red flags going up all of a sudden, and mm. it is cause for concern. So we're bracing ourselves, really, John.
let's just I want to pull back a little bit. Um, 08,000 uh, Annette's waiting to put her question. But you, you, you talked about our own immunity. Um, researchers have suggested that, uh, and this was a study, let me just find the provenance of this by Imperial College London, uh, that um, this booster, booster shot uh, will have, uh, the effect it will have on Omicron, say it will provide around 85% protection against severe illness. And let's remind ourselves that's what the vaccine is about. It's about you not ending up in hospital. It's not going to stop you getting it, but it's going to stop you ending up in hospital. So what is the booster doing extra for us? Just qualify that. Yes, it's very important that we address this for our listeners. So number one, immunity starts to drop after six months with coronavirus vaccines. And number two, we've got this awkward beast called Omicron amongst us. And what the boosters do is they boost the number and range of antibodies that we have. So because quite a few of our antibodies have been rendered useless, um, we need more of the useful antibodies that are still working. So by giving you a booster, we're making more of the antibodies and of the more that we are making, there will be more of the effective ones that can still attack and cancel out the viruses. So to summarize, the boosters make more antibodies. We need more antibodies because Omicron is bypassing some of the pre-existing antibodies. And that extra antibody is the difference between allowing Omicron to make you ill or us canceling it and remaining well. So if we look at, then at South Africa, uh, where, where this was first identified, I'm not saying it came from South Africa, but that's where it was first sequenced. Its genomic sequence was was confirmed and then it was given a name and then it was created a variant of concern. The evidence we're getting out of South Africa would suggest to some that this is less infectious. But of course, our population is very different to South Africa. What do you interpret South Africa is telling us with regard to Omicron? So if, yeah, John, if we look at the graph for the South African infections, again, it was a very steep curve, you know, very rapid rise in case numbers. So definitely it's much more infectious. On the other hand, uh, the South African population is different to ours. Number one, uh, a significant uh, percentage of the South African population had gone through serial infections. So they would have had biological immunity. And one more thing that works in South Africa's favor is a considerably younger population. And it occurred at a time in South Africa when it is their warm part of the year. And so they're more outdoors, et cetera. Uh, they're mostly outdoors anyway compared to us, but more so because it was during the warm season. So um, is it there didn't, it, yes, indeed. So it didn't, it didn't result in a lot of deaths, which is good, which is good. The only concern here is that in the northern latitudes, the population structure is we are a lot older population, considerably older than the South African population. And older people, as we know, uh, mm. suffer more from the effects of a SARS-CoV-2 infection. For any age group, older age groups suffer more, more casualties, et cetera. So that we won't know. But uh, the South African experience was it came and it went. OK, Annette in Porter said your question, Annette, to uh, Dr. Barrett Pankania. Thank you and good morning to you both. Um, Dr. Pankania, I'd love your opinion on this, please. Um, we always know that a PCR test is for people with symptoms. Now, I have a fully vaccinated friend who has had colds and sniffles um, and obviously symptomatic of a cold, but thinks a lateral test is all she needs to do. Now, it was negative, um, so she's continuing to go out as normal. Now, other friends who've had similar things have actually took lateral over the course of a week. They all came back negative, but then a week later, having still having a cold symptoms, but very, very minor, um, did a further lateral, which then was positive, and the PCR came back positive too. Symptoms still no more than a minor cold. So are laterals a waste of time, as they may be the biggest spreaders due to unreliability? 
Yeah, good Barrett. question. Very good question, Annette, and something uh, myself and many of my colleagues have been wrestling with all the time, because uh, a negative LF lateral flow test is not truly negative. It may be negative, but we can never be sure. So if you are symptomatic, we always suggest do a PCR because the PCR is more sensitive. In other words, it will pick up minute amounts of um, viral RNA, amplify it, detect it, and then produce a result. So when you have what you would call, ah, it's only a minor cold. Yes, it may be a minor cold to you, but if it is laden with coronaviruses, not a cold, mm. but coronaviruses, then you are spreading it to others. And here is the difficulty about the clear communications that we should really have done, which is you may be completely without symptoms, you may be with mild symptoms, but if you were to do a test and do a proper test, at least you will probably not infect someone and harm them. So a little inconvenience of doing a test goes a very mm -hmm. long way towards protecting other people. No, I think that's that's exactly how I see it. It's just that I feel that there, I mean, it may well be that at the beginning that they gave that information out, but I don't think it's the information that people are getting there. They think they'll do a lateral. If it's negative, that's it. Um, and I think, um, you know, it's an unwise thing that they rely on those laterals instead of actually just booking a PCR. But um, thank you. You more or less, um, you know, think the same as exactly what I do. And you're Annette, the expert. Bless you. Thank, you. thank you very much for joining us. Annette, thank there there said, Met you Same to you. Just to, just to qualify that, because we had, you and I had talked, perhaps we almost for two years, about lateral flow tests and the fact that they were probably as we were speaking about 18 months ago, uh, that they were probably around about 60%. The, a study, I think it was by Oxford, suggested that they were actually about 80, 90%. The question, of course, now is, do they work with Omicron or are we conflating colds with coronavirus? Because the symptoms for Omicron seem to be more cold-like than yes. Delta. Yes. So, yes, the symptoms for cold-like, uh, for, for Omicron, sorry, are more cold like absolutely john and do the lateral flow tests work absolutely yes i have checked and double checked on this because the uh, the proteins that the lateral flow devices look for are not the spike proteins they look for other proteins on the virus and those other proteins have not changed their shape or structure so they will still detect the same proteins that they were detecting an, under delta and others so lateral flow tests have not been rendered null and void just because omicron has arrived okay uh, let's go to this question we recorded uh, just before we came on air i'm jill from winterhorn I recently had COVID and I heard that the lateral flow tests aren't very reliable if you've recently had COVID. What can I do to test myself if I want to go out meeting people? That's an interesting question, Barrett. Yes, and it's very difficult because um, if we do a PCR on somebody who's had a recent infection, a PCR can remain positive for up to 90 days in some people. So a positive PCR having just recovered from an infection uh, doesn't give us much information. All it tells us is, yes, I detect bits and pieces of uh, viral RNA. So that's no good. You wouldn't be infectious for 90 days, though. I mean, if you got a positive, you took a, took a test 60 days after you were in bed with this thing, you wouldn't still be shedding virus, would you? Indeed, indeed, yes, indeed. So the our supposition is that you are infectious, infectious for uh, most people, not all people, most people, up to ten days following your infection. So in answer to this lady, what I would say is, well, look, you've had your infection, and it is recent infection. We assume that your infectious period was ten days, and after the ten days of being out of circulation. We can safely assume that uh, you you are not infectious anymore. Having said that, there are always qualifiers. Nothing is straightforward. Some people who are 
immune suppressed, have got immune suppressive illnesses or are on steroid drugs, etc., uh, they can remain infectious for longer, much longer than uh, uh, somebody who is otherwise normal. So again, with people who are immune suppressed, et cetera, a word of caution that just because it's day 10 doesn't mean you stop being infectious. Now, the, 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 the interesting bits are here. Um, lateral flow looks for viral protein. And if you still detect the presence of viral protein, it's telling you, I am finding viral protein here. You know, there is virus coming out. PCR detects bits and pieces of viral RNA, uh, which can remain persistent for a long time. So lateral flow can be a guide to, um, am I still uh, with viral proteins? Uh, in which case, do I need to be precautionary and take extra measures not to circulate? I hope that answers her question. I think I think I think it does. And just to be clear on something, if you've had Delta in the last two to three months, are you going to then get Omicron because that's going to be different? Or will that Delta infection you've had in the last 90 days give you some greater protection? We don't know. Uh, the assumption will be that the Delta infection generated uh, antibodies and a little bit of biological immunity, and therefore it's giving you a shield of protection. But the answer is, we don't know. We just don't know with natural infections how much of a immunity did you make. That's why we always say to people that even if you've had your infection, please take the vaccine because there is more certainty with the immunity produced by vaccines compared to the infections. So can somebody who's had a recent Delta also get Omicron? Well, biologically, if you made enough antibodies, maybe not. But is it an absolute no, 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 no. Of course, you can get uh, reinfected with Omicron. Dr. Barrett Pankania, back with us on BBC Radio Bristol, answering your COVID questions. Here's the number. Call 08000 855 BBC Radio Bristol. You can, of course, text and email as well. John.d at bbc.co.uk is the email address. Pammy Muir joins me now with a, a question. Pammy. Yes, uh, Robbie in Yate has got in touch. Now, they said, how is it that some people have been going to parties where everyone is socialising with each other and some have ended up catching COVID and others don't? And he also said, with everyone vaccinated too. Barrett. So... That's normal biological processes because nothing is 100%. Uh, so that individual who was at the party was unfortunate. They got a hit. Uh, they were probably standing very close to somebody who was infectious. Uh, they were more vulnerable. They got a big loading dose. And then somebody who was not really taking part in the party but was present uh, on the sidelines uh, quietly chatting rather than singing or, or being in the middle of the crowd didn't get hit. Those are normal uh, variations that we always expect. So it is not at all surprising. But I tell you what is uh, very, very clear is we've had, um, for example, choir singing practices, our choir singing gatherings. And because, you know, you are really throwing out a lot of virus particles when you are singing, a significant number of the people got infected and quite a few also died from uh, that choir practice. Admittedly, people who are uh, with choir, etc., sometimes tend to be in the older age groups too. But yeah, this is normal variation, really. It's not a case of um, why did it happen? We, ex we don't expect a 100% hit. That's what I'm trying to say. I just want to talk, uh, before we pause for, for the travel news here on BBC Radio Bristol, I just want to talk about where, our, where we are right now, because we are five days away from Christmas. Uh, we have the, the latest SAGE uh, figures that were published, and I think it's really important that, to say that these are models and scenarios. They are based on the data we have right now, and we've talked about what the, the missing equation, or missing one of the key missing parts of the equation, is how severe uh, Omicron is from the point of view of giving you severe illness. So we've got rising infections, plateauing hospitalizations, a government that has 
put in advice and we have other countries like the Netherlands who've locked down. We've got Germany talking about mandatory vaccination along with Austria. We've got borders closing. In the many things that you are, Barrett, you're a pandemic planner and, and you have been a pandemic planner here in the Southwest. What should we be doing, minded that five days from now, we'll be gathering for Christmas? A uh, number of issues here, John. So the red flags for me are the rising number of cases and the steepness of that curve of uh, the, the, the rate of rise is phenomenal. OK, so that's the warning signal. So with those warning signal, um, if you are getting together with family and friends, etc., uh, come the 25th, 24th, whenever you all get together, then now, in fact, it's almost high noon that you reduce your potential exposure to somebody who is infectious, not in your group. So you need to sort of remove yourself from uh, engagement with groups and parties and gatherings, uh, meaning you're doing your due diligence for when you're going to meet up with friends and family over the Christmas shutdown. And then I would also do a personal assessment when you are going to get together, all of you. Am I well? Have I got any new signs and symptoms? Have I got that new runny nose? Have I got that new headache? Have I got that loss of smell and taste? And then it's not it's not absolute 100 percent, but it's it's the best we can do, which is do a lateral flow test as well and make sure that it is negative. Do it properly. Take a good sample, all of you. And then so what I'm saying is if you take those m multiple layers of precautions and earlier due diligence and then when you meet up, you know that you have taken all necessary measures to meet up in a safe way. And of course, by all means, meet up. Just do your due diligence. Now, on a broader level, John, what would I be advising? I always advise that if you want to get on top of a pandemic uh, with a rising tide of case numbers, you apply the brakes. You apply the brakes early. Uh, early, fast, extensive interventions uh, wins the day. Um, late intervention equals you are only catching up. So if I were in charge, what would I be saying? I would say you need to apply the brakes now. I'm not asking for a lockdown or anything, but I am saying what the chief medical officer said. Um, reduce your interactions now, not tomorrow, not in the new year, now, because there is a riding tide of cases. And finally, one more thing, wear your mask. Wear a good quality mask, wear it properly. That will protect you. Even if others are not wearing their masks, don't worry about it. You look after yourself, wear your mask. Dr. Barrett Pangania, back with us on BBC Radio Bristol. The number you need, 08000 855 949. More from Barrett's between now and 11. BBC Radio Bristol. Christmas means family. Best time of the year. It means getting together with family more than anything else. I love Christmas because it's family time. The sound of Christmas, where we live. It's time for the Christmas jumpers to come out. Great day. All the kids love it. You see their little faces light up. Wonderful. BBC Radio Bristol. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, everyone. 24 minutes to 11 on a Monday morning. Joe Lima has the latest travel news. Joe. M4 heading this way from Wiltshire. Watch out for that closure. It's still in place, I'm afraid. This on the westbound side from 14 Hungerford to 15 at Swindon East. It follows a serious accident which happened last night. The road likely to stay closed for much more of the morning, we think. Uh, traffic uh, is queuing through Hungerford and Marlborough as it diverts around the closure. This all because of accident investigation work. You've got delay in Avonmouth along Smoke Lane towards the junction of King's Western Lane as you head towards St Andrew's Gate roundabout, towards the Filton roundabout, slight queue on Southmead Road. In Headley Park, St Peter's Rise is closed both ways 
for roadworks. The church, I'm told, at the bottom is open. Uh, Headley Lane up towards Church Road is where you'll see it closed in both directions. Headley Lane, by the way, is as you come from Hartcliffe Way. Uh, we'll do some temporary lights around. They're still in place for a little while yet. Henbury's Kings Western Road. Those lights are there at Long Cross. That's the Lawrence Western turn off. And also temporary lights along the A38 Bridgewater Road. Uh, those lights there due to telecoms work at Bishopsworth Road. And if you're heading across the Cleveland Bridge in Bath at the moment, uh, that tailback goes back about 15 minutes as you try to reach the London Road. The queue goes back onto Bathwick Street. Those temporary lights adding about 50 minutes to your journey. The bridge, of course, has that two metre width restriction currently in place. Any more you've got for me on the roads, if you want to call, here's the number 08000 855 949. <laughs> John Darvall. BBC Radio Bristol. Call now. Get your question answered by Dr. Parrot Bankania. What is the booster doing extra for us? Immunity starts to drop after six months with coronavirus vaccines. And number two, we've got this awkward beast called Omicron amongst us. And what the boosters do is they boost the number and range of antibodies that we have. So because quite a few of our antibodies have been rendered useless. We need more of the useful antibodies that are still working. So by giving you a booster, we're making more of the antibodies and of the more that we are making, there will be more of the effective ones that can still attack and cancel out the virus. So to summarize, the boosters make more antibodies we need more antibodies because Omicron is bypassing some of the pre-existing antibodies. And that extra antibody is the difference between allowing Omicron to make you ill or us cancelling it and remaining well. Call 08000 855 949. BBC Radio Bristol. Oh, 
Joel Corey and Mabel, their new single, Christmas song, I Wish. There is something very real about what's going on at the moment. And, and let me give you an example of this. Uh, you may be a fan of Il Devo. They've been around since 2003. Huge international stars. Uh, over a hundred, I think over 30 million records sold. Loads of gold disc. Their last performance was actually in Bath on the 6th of December. And you may know that Carlos Marin, who was the baritone within Il Devo, uh, died yesterday. Age 53, having been put into an induced coma. And there's nothing more that they could do for him in the hospital in Manchester. He got COVID while on tour in the UK. As I say, last performance in Bath, 53. We don't know how, what else may have, or may not have been the case, but we've lost well, Jethro, the drummer from the Wurzels, all dying of COVID. So this is real. Um, it's about judgments and it's about questions and you will have questions. Dr. Barrett Pancania is back to answer those questions this morning. Um, let's go to Jesse in Yatton. Jesse, good morning. Oh, good morning. Good morning. Your question to Barrett, Jesse. Um, good morning, uh, Barrett. Um, how long does a booster give you good protection? Um, I had my injection, my booster, back in September. So it's already three months ago. So how long does that, you know, how long is it good for? Do you have any idea or not? Nobody mentions it. Barrett. Yeah, lovely question, Jesse. And it, this is something that is uh, taxing our minds. And we are a little bit concerned. So um, the answer is we don't know. But I estimate that it will be as good as the other vaccines and, you know, the antibody levels, etc. So I would expect at least six months, but we need to be prepared. And this is something that we are not talking about, but we need to be prepared. So the pre preparation is as follows. If we find that boosting with the same vaccine that we used for the uh, primary immunization, uh, is still dropping immunity, and we've got Omicron circulating amongst us, that we may need to have a modified vaccine to mirror what Omicron is and immunize uh, with that one as well. So one of the thoughts in my mind is come the new year, we may have to deploy a revised version of the vaccines to mirror what Omicron is doing? It's a good question, Jesse. Thank you very much indeed. And of course, Jesse brilliantly highlights there the fact that this booster program has been ongoing, vaccinating booster, giving booster vaccinations to the most vulnerable group and their vaccination, as you've already indicated, their vaccination status and their, um, I suppose their immunity is going to be waning. I think so. So we've got to be careful. And this is where I do get cross, John, because we've got uh, the narrative on um, media, mainstream media, which is get your boosters. And the, the, the understanding from that narrative is get your boosters and you've got a protective shield around you. Not true. The only way to have your protective shield around you is to have your boosters as well as protect yourself with infection control measures, like avoid the three C's, which is crowds, closeness to other people, and closed indoor spaces, which are poorly ventilated, and wear a good quality mask. We have to do all those layers of protection, as well as boosters. So it's very unfortunate that the my perception is, and I, I did a little straw poll of friends and they all said yes our understanding is i'm boosted therefore i'm protected not true be protected with multiple layers of infection control measures as well as your booster alex and bradley stoke thank you for your message uh, if you are fully vaccinated including the booster and catch covid any version are you less likely to pass it on a hey, good question so yes the answer the short answer is yes so a person who is fully immunized is infected for a shorter period of time and is spewing out 
fewer virus particles when they are infected. So on two counts, uh, the, their infection is of a shorter duration and the secretion of the viruses is in smaller amounts. So A, fully immunized person is less infectious when they get infected. And this is, uh, you're taking me on to the basis for um, vaccine passports. Uh, uh, somebody with a vaccine it's inevitable. passport. It is inevitable. It is inevitable, indeed, John. You know, somebody who is fully immunized is less infectious, and that's why they're saying we want to have vaccine passports. Pammy Muir joins me uh, with a message. Pammy. Yes, Mo in Clifton has got in touch. Now, they said, how quickly do babies recover from COVID? And is there a way to speed up recovery? Barrett. Yeah, so to speed up recovery for everyone and anyone, and I say this repeatedly, is your body is under assault. So please rest, rest and recuperate and, you know, keep your hydration up. You might not feel like eating, but hydration is important and rest. Rest is really, really important. People are um, very keen to return back to normality. And if your body has had a good kicking by a virus, your muscles, your joints, your immune system, et cetera, it needs to calmly reset itself before you start doing your exercises and running around and work. So is there a magic formula of getting better fast? Rest. Uh, how soon do babies and children recover? It's the same sort of thing as adults. And, uh, the good thing is most of our children don't suffer a uh, serious illness and are not seriously ill with um, uh, breathing problems or aching muscles, etc. Uh, they are, by and large, uh, not affected by the infection. Before we go to our next question, I just want to go through the timeline of this thing because it seems to have changed from the point of view of exposure to being positive to ending up in hospital and then all the other awful steps that could come thereafter. It seems to have changed. Omicron seems to be much tighter and shorter than Delta. So if yes. I was to be exposed today, when would I be positive? When would I start to show positivity? Yeah, so that's a good question, John. And we feel that the uh, incubation period is shortening with Omicron. So what was previously between three to seven days, uh, I feel, and this is my experiences in dealing with outbreaks, is that the incubation period is a lot shorter. So between two to five days, a lot shorter than with the Delta variant. Of course, you can still be a case up to 10 days post exposure, but we do find that the majority are presenting as cases uh, two to five days post exposure. So then we get to the next stage where your body is obviously fighting it. Each of our bodies, even with all the vaccines in, in our systems or none, will go through the process of, of fighting it and you'll get in, you know, inflammation and all the other things. How quickly are you going to be in a situation where you are getting better or not getting better? Is that now still 10 to 14 days or is that now tighter? No, it's still 10 to 14 days. And the key thing, now that you've asked the question, I will answer it. <laughs> the key thing to look out for is that you uh, watch out for your breathing. And it's very important that you uh, don't have breathing problems, et cetera, which usually present at about day five to seven of your infection. Uh, that's the key time when those viral pneumonias, if they're going to develop, start to present themselves. So your watchfulness is uh, be careful around day five to seven. Is your breathing OK? Are you suddenly short of breath? Are you dropping your oxygen levels? That Those are the very key important dates. OK, let's go to Ethiel, who is in Yate. Ethiel, good morning. Good morning, John. Good your morning, Dr Barrett. Your question to Barrett, Ethiel. I'm trying to be as cautious as I can be. Therefore, I quarantine my shopping and my post for three days. 
Is that good enough for Omicron or should I be doing something different? I, I personally would go easy to be truthful. So when uh, the pandemic started, um, we had our obsession with this is droplet spread. So don't worry about it. And then unfortunately, very late in the day, uh, the penny dropped that this is aerosol spread rather than formite spread. So my advice to you would be, don't worry about um, quarantining your incoming mail and shopping and all that, because you keep your hands clean. That is the key thing, because it's handling the stuff and then taking your dirty hand to your nose and mouth that gets you infected. But fomite spread, in other words, contaminated surfaces, is a very small contributor to infection. The biggest contributor to infection is aerosol spread. It's in the air. That's how you get infected. So maybe as of today, a uh, little Christmas present for you. You can give up on quarantining your incoming shopping and mail. There you go, Ethel. <laughs> thank you very much. There thank you go. Don't have to wipe you. everything down. Uh, Ethel, thank you. <laughs> have a white free Christmas. Um, Thanks, let's, and you. Um, I know. Let's just quali- I want to qualify something um, with regards to, because you're a, an expert in pandemic planning and all the other things that we've been talking about. A bit of a debate that was raging uh, with regard to SAGE, um, which, of course, uh, advises the government. Uh, and advisors advise and ministers decide is the, is the mantra. But SAGE is the Scientific Advisory Group for Emergency. Emergencies. They've come up with these scenarios that could be anything from 200 to 6,000 deaths a day from Omicron. If you were to look at that as a pandemic planner, as a public health expert, would you be looking at the 6,000 or the 200? I wouldn't be looking at the 6,000 because they're covering their um, their range. You know, they're given free yeah. reign to talk. And they gave the minimum and maximum. To be true, to be truthful, John, we can't cope with six thousand deaths a day. We just cannot. We, we've never planned for such an Armageddon-type situation, and I hope we never get there. So I would be looking at the median in the middle. You know, what do we expect in the middle, and then uh, caution because we don't want to have hairs running and fear and and worry all around the country. Uh, so I certainly wouldn't be looking at either extremes because I feel that's just a ballpark figure to play with. I would look at what what looks reasonable in the middle. And when we were doing pandemic influenza planning, we planned for up to 3% case fatality rate. I remember very, very clearly asking a very senior person, what happens if a case fatality rate is over 4%? And their answer was, we've never planned for it. So with respect to, you know, where would I be looking at? I I wouldn't be looking at either extremes. I'd look in the middle somewhere. And and maybe that's, I mean, this is, uh, we've spoken about Professor Robert Dingwell, who you, who you know, who used to be part of uh, the JCVI, who says that, yes. Um, maybe the fundamental problem of scientific ethics at this stage is that this hardwired uh, for negativity bias is that we hear all these huge numbers, Barrett. We get really scared. Government gets scared. And it all makes us feel pretty rubbish. Yes. Yeah. You, they need me, John, because I was never one of them. Honestly, <laughs> right? Honestly. Well, maybe you should have a word with Robert Dingwell because he's left JVZI. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just I've wanted to raise taken, the, I've always the taken a, what you would call a real life view on real life things. And I used to be in those rooms and I used to look at my fellow emergency planners and say, come on, you know, they used to talk about all sorts of things, which is best not to talk about on air. And mm. My middle order view was life is what life is and life continues in its normal way. And the normal way is uh, we don't have an Armageddon, right? And so I have always been that positive guy which says, be measured, be reasonable, be fair. It's uh, don't look at worst case scenarios. At the same time, don't be lazy and just look at best case scenarios only. Middle order is better. Middle order. Let's go to Barry in Bishopston for the last question of the hour. Uh, Barry, your question. Good morning, John. Um, back in the 80s, we used to use uh, ionizers and the like to clear the air. And I wondered if 
the use of ionizers or electrostatic precipitators would be useful indoors to remove the airborne particles? Shortest ah. possible answer, no. And I'm spending a lot of energy talking to nursing homes, etc., where I take part in outbreak control exercises. And I tell them, come on, you've spent all this money on this fancy equipment that some salesman has sold to you. Uh, you don't need it and you are falsely reassuring yourself. So a lot of them are using fogging machines and this electrostatic stuff. And my answer to both is, come on, look, think about it. So you've done your electrostatic charging, whatever you do, this fancy stuff, and you think your room is now clean. And then I walk in spewing out millions of virus particles as soon as your electrostatic stuff has finished. The room is dirty and contaminated again. So you need to look at it like this. Everything, everyone, every place is potentially infectious and then deal with it accordingly. So it's potentially infectious at all times. That way, you never drop your guard. Barry, thank you very much. Good question. Uh, one more has just come in from Sue in Bath. Says, I'm flying to Scotland to see my son on the 23rd. Would you go? Uh, if you are flying, then you have to be worried about the aeroplane and the airport, etc. So if you have to go, go, but please, wear a good quality mask, a good quality FFP2 mask will at least protect you. And don't worry about the other people who are not wearing their masks. That's their problem. You wear yours and wear it properly. And hopefully that will keep you safe. We've had a lot of comments in today from uh, people all over the world who are listening to you right now, uh, thanking you for your sage advice uh, for the last uh, couple of years, Barrett. Um, we are what? 23 months into this pandemic um yes. the first time it hit our shores was the 31st of january 2020 last 45 seconds we're pandemic is there any chance that this will become endemic next year or are we in a cycle for a good few years yet no john it's endemic it's endemic i uh, we've got to try and live with it uh, but it is very much an endemic situation, I'm afraid. But being endemic means that we live with it like flu, but we seem to be in pandemic mode with, with, with variants, which of course changes everything, doesn't it? Yeah, so what we'll have is an extensively immunised world population, uh, just like we have an extensively immunised population against measles, etc., and that will keep us safe. Um, you know, the viruses sometimes mutate and become innocuous, but not always. So I do expect that this is something we're going to have to live with for a long time. Dr. Barrett Pankania, for this year and for last year and looking forward to next year, thank you for being with me and our listeners on BBC Radio Bristol. And we wish you and your family a Merry Christmas. Thank you. Happy Christmas to everyone, too. Thank you. From the BBC Sounds app, on your smart speaker. Thanks so much, Barry. You were brilliant, as always. Thank you. Well, have a happy Christmas, all of you in that studio. We, yeah, you, we first on. met, I think, on the 21st of January, two years ago. <laughs> it's very smart, isn't it? And I'm sure we'll probably have you back on at some point in the new year as well. Inevitable. Um, have a lovely Christmas and um, hopefully we'll speak to you uh, next month rather than this month. Okay. Take care. Brilliant. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.